Hello everyone! Welcome back to the RationalInvestor.com's Brighter Chicken Show! Back, 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 back! Holy geez, somebody just paid the 35, so it's 36 offered in the hangout right now. We're wondering uh, how high uh, they'll take, they'll FOMO this hangout. <laughs> oh no! Lou hit the bid, bastard. So now it's uh, back to 34. Uh, I'm just kidding. Anyway, uh, welcome uh, back to the frivolity. Um, it is, where the hell are we? It's uh, getting on the end of January, eh? Yeah, January 24th. Jeez. <laughs> We're already uh, almost uh, one twelfth through uh, this new uh, this new uh, year. Uh, what a tumultuous uh, January it's been, eh? And also, too, we're coming into the last week of January, so we should probably keep an eye on things like uh, January barometer uh, to see what those kind of reports are suggesting the year uh, should look like. Usually what ends up happening is you get some sort of pullback right at the beginning of the year. Then a bit of a rally into the spring, you know, sell in May and walk away, all that kind of talk. Um, usually the markets are pretty well bid through the summer. Sometimes you get a bit of a pullback there uh, at the end of June. Uh, markets rel relatively well bid in through the late summer. Then, uh, you know, the pros come back from the Hamptons and they hit those bids into September, October. But in some sort of seasonal trough, uh, rally into uh, the end of the year and do it all over again i mean that's usually how this game goes every once in a while you get years that are outliers um you know looking back on the price charts i think that was their plan the one percent plan all that kind of stuff cycle analysis and frankly speaking i think COVID actually just caught the market off guard i really don't think that even the one percent were expecting COVID to be as ugly as it was so um, I do hear there's lots of sort of conspiracy theories and all that kind of stuff running around, but, eh, you know, the sad thing is, is, uh, we humans, we're very emotional creatures. I do see that, you know, when we get into sort of apex events, there are some nefarious characters in our society that help the situation along inject a little bit more fear, inject a little bit more uh, euphoria uh, into the space. I don't know whether that is that is a predetermined plan or it's just a silly function of us silly humans. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's ironic, really. Um, and this week in particular, uh, you know, one of the main reasons why we're starting a bit later here today, and I'm sure a lot of uh, people on YouTube and stuff that uh, like to watch this uh, in real time, uh, my apologies. Uh, but this, uh, you know, TRI's uh, spring, or I guess winter uh, school term uh, has just started up in earnest, and the level oneers, uh, they're getting just a big old smack in the face of reality. Uh, here this first week uh, official week of learning in the program <laughs> uh, just big old whack of strategic planning where the hell does cryptocurrency fall in this crazy facazy world and how on earth is, is one supposed to make sense of what the hell the one percent have done to us here it's a bit of a shame you know um one thing I would strongly suggest you all do, try not to get too wrapped up in making emotional decisions while we're in the sort of apex of the storm. Um, you know, a lot of people going in FOMO buying Bitcoins at thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. I don't know whether that's really a sound money management um, going forward. Um, and if anything, what I often suggest to people do uh, through these kind of market states is, well, you're just not allowed to buy it. You got, you, you have to just sort of sit on the sidelines and watch the insanity. And if you do want to participate, the great part about commodities is they are so crazy cyclical. Uh, you can pretty much set your watch. In fact, I used to uh, trade with a guy back uh, 
And actually, I saw him on YouTube. Uh, man, he sure is looking old. But a guy I used to trade with back in the 80s, uh, Kenny Roberts, uh, he used to always just simply uh, be hunting um, uh, 5 to 10 year highs and lows on commodities. And he would just trade them, swing, trade them back and forth. Um, and, you know, the fascinating thing is I even remember through the 1990s, which was a horrible commodity bear secular market, there were some great moves. I remember one year corn prices took off uh, because of a blout. I remember cotton prices went absolutely insane. Hell, even the uh, Briex scandal, which that was a gold stock that went from 20 cents to over $200 a share. That actually happened right in the middle of a gold secular bear market. So, you know, just just because, uh, you know, secularly we're going to be moving away from commodity preference, that doesn't mean you can't make good money on, uh, on nice uh, seasonal setups. And then, of course, throw a sprinkle in some uh, half-decent technical uh, criteria you know even in the worst of bear markets we always say there's always a bull somewhere um, you know if you're a crypto commodity uh, fan now is the time when you really want to build sort of your list of who who's got cred in this space um, there are the fluffy promoter people that have like a hundred thousand views on their channel at any given point in time and they're they're selling the hopium you know it might even take some time for you to actually just sit and watch all these influencers within the space to actually create a list of well you know that guy actually sounds like he knows what he's talking about <clears throat> i don't know I mean, um, uh, hopefully what you see when you watch this uh, channel is uh, I, I just trade whatever I think I can make money on. <laughs> uh, if I like the fundamental story and the, you know, the wind is blowing at the particular market's back uh, and, um, you know, all the technical criteria comes in, I'll trade broiler chickens. So that's why uh, I named this show this silly little name. Because I'm asset agnostic. I don't really care. And actually, it's interesting for um, you know new people to trading in the site, you know, level oneers. Um, you know, uh, we have a whole bunch in our library, a whole bunch of third-party sort of videos and stuff that I would strongly suggest that you kind of watch and get familiar with if you're looking for material outside of the current week's um, uh, material to chew on. And uh, one uh, video in particular that I love showing everybody, uh, if you really want to be a trader, is uh, this gentleman. Uh, he's an he's absolute sweet. sweetheart. Um, you know, you definitely you want to uh, leave him in charge of your kids for a weekend or two uh, if you're going on vacation. At uh, not. <laughs> Uh, I mean, no offense, and you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, telling him anything he doesn't know. This guy's a total fucking asshole. He's richer than probably all of us put together. He, but so what? I mean, he he knows his shit and he knows how to trade. And the most important message I got out of this two-hour lecture to these people is um, is. Uh, if you really fancy yourself a trader, right? What you really are is you are trading, quote unquote, volatility. So, you know, if your asset just goes into the tank and, and the volatility comes right out of it, then you could call yourself that asset trader and you're just going to be sitting there doing nothing. So, you know, he's kind of a jerk way of saying it, but it's a very true statement. And, I, you know, I suggest all the people on our site watch this and listen to him. I mean, he's talking the truth. It's not a pretty truth, but it is a truth. And that, you know, I mean, you got to know what the hell you're getting involved in here if you really want to uh, play this game. But, you know, the point that I just make here is I'll trade anything. You know, if I see, you know me, uh, weekly W's, right? Give me a half-decent story and away I go. Um... You know, uh, so my point here with regard to cryptocurrencies, I think it's absolutely critical right now that you really get to know your fundamental story. 
right? What are the fundamental drivers? Why, what, what is value? Um, I'm fearful that uh, there are some underlying subtle trends that are developing here that I don't think are gonna sit well with Wall Street whatsoever. Um, and, you know, we often conjecture, you know, Bitcoin's gone from like, you know, what, it was three grand there last uh, March, now it's 30, I mean, 10X in a year. Oh yeah, that's a nice, healthy, natural move, sure. Um, what actually facilitates the technical correction of that kind of move? And it's usually what I found in this space. It really, ironically enough, will have almost nothing to do with Bitcoin. Um, and what I also noticed too, like especially through the 2017 market, is you won't hear a politician say boo about Bitcoin. In fact, like all the Bitcoin maximalists and all the sort of, you know, crypto people who are in it for the technology and stuff, they'll goad the politicians into saying boo about Bitcoin. <laughs> and then as soon as they do, the, the, the crypto kids just come out and just shit all over them. So I think the politicians learn, okay, you know, Bitcoin is probably hands off. It's, it's still relatively pure. You know, the tragedy in the cryptocurrency space is not the Bitcoin stories. It's the, you know, what was that boxer? Uh, there was a boxer who got all tied up in some uh, cryptocurrency promotion back a couple years ago. What was his name? Um, Floyd. Shane says Floyd. Floyd, 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 what is it? Floyd, man, man, it starts with an M, right? Mayweather? Floyd Mayweather? Yeah. Thank you, sir. And, and then also remember uh, remember that, uh, that uh, <laughs> TV star karate guy turned police officer? Uh, what was his name? Steven Seagal. Remember him? Uh, he got all wrapped up in some crazy cryptocurrency scam. So that those are the stories that are actually gonna um, uh, that are that are gonna unwind the the bull. Not really Bitcoin itself. Um, I'd also say too. It's not really like I'm bearish of Bitcoin or bearish of good fundamental cryptocurrency stories. Eh, I'm pretty bullish. It's just that, how do I get bullish at like 30 grand when I know the cost of production is like 5, 10 Gs? I, I, you know, unfortunately as a classic commodity investor, it's very difficult for me to do that. So, you know, that, that, that's it. And what I like is the principle of sort of overlapping, like cost of production with things like reload zones, right? And then you sort of can, you know, especially off like higher time frame charts, you can, um, you can quite often when you see those kind of characteristics in the cryptocurrency space, the public isn't interested. It's guys like me and Da Vinci doing crazy videos on YouTube talking to ourselves. <laughs> and, you know, just nobody's interested. Every, ironically enough, you'll go out in the marketplace and everybody's going to be bearish. So, you know, I don't. I, it's a very hard message to convey to the public that, you know, but it was beautiful in the level one class today, this morning. You know, you got to force yourself to be a buyer when others are not interested and a seller when others are interested. Or, you know, as the, uh, the, the cliche goes, um, you know, uh, when they're yelling, actually, let's see if you guys can finish this. Because uh, you guys over on YouTube, you got to get some value out of this too. So when they're yelling, everybody in public is yelling about something, what should you be doing? Pretty straightforward. Yeah, well, they're very good. Well, the Hangout people, if there's any level oneers um, that are in the Hangout, you can see what they're all typing away here. I got 31 bid. I can't get 32. What did we hit? All time high was like 35 or something like that, right? Um, yeah, but, uh, you know, we got about 60, 70 people there. So S Sodoma says uh, selling. Right, so, man, this is a lesson I learned like 20, 30 years ago. And it, it, it's just as true then as it is today. I mean, there's no difference. It never changes. Uh, do you sell everything?
Do you have to sell everything? Is somebody holding a gun to your head? You must sell all? No. But on balance, when everybody else, especially if you had the fucking balls to step up and buy when nobody else was interested, right, the, the, the general principle in life is, you know, when they're all going fucking crazy apeshit, just spoon feed. Let them have some. Um, very hard principle to convey to people. Uh, remember, I've been at this a very, very, very long time. <laughs> you know, I got my first job in this business when I was, you know, in 1988. That was a long time ago. Fuck. So, you know, uh, I'm here to try and help. Um, I hope you get this message. It's very difficult for me to step in the front of that crazy market there a month ago in Bitcoin and be like, whoa, calm down, people, calm down, calm down. <laughs> Is it possible? <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, the primary purpose of these uh, Sunday classes now while the school is in is actually to speak directly to the students uh, and just sort of dovetail because, like I said, uh, I mean, <laughs> is it really realistic for you to get the whole damn world strategic vision, money flows, demographic flows, interest rate cycles all in one week? Uh, I mean, this is a learning journey that you're on and it might take a year. It might take five years for you to actually see this this cycle turn here. But you know, I've been at the game so long, I can feel the turn. Um, what's really interesting was, uh, you know, I, I, I uh, traded, I was a broker, so I was uh, definitely watching every single day, journaling, taking notes, right? Um, I remember distinctly the environment through the, uh, through the dot-com peak. And what's, you know, what is just so startling is, I honestly think the only thing that really changed on in in sort of the world uh, between now and then is nothing more than just our attitudes. No, nothing else is really any different. We humans, we're humans, right? Unfortunately, the system itself is designed, and I think this is why the banksters and shit don't really want the public to really understand these Jupiter Saturn crosses and maybe with the evolution of the internet and you know the information age the way I'm able to get this out sending out those money master videos and stuff we always talk about it was great to see that uh, we were sharing that in the level one classroom again today um, I actually believe that the the species itself is very vulnerable to these emotional anxietal swings and the powers of be know this and they take advantage of it like I said they kind of juice the system um, I'm not quite sure what the role mr. Trump was supposed to play through this I think if there was a juicer of the system for fear he was the absolute perfect proxy. Uh, he did his job admirably. In fact, right into the very apex of the event, he tried as hard as he could to try and get the public to revolt. So, you know, history, uh, we'll look uh, back. You know, there's actually an interesting video that uh, Shane shared with me. And this guy, he's just freaky how sick this guy is. Uh, if you're really into this sort of uh, next level stuff, oh crap, did I get rid of it? Oh, I thought I had it on here. What did I do with him? It's just the coolest uh, Shane. Uh, you're gonna be a pub. Well, actually, I, mean, well, I shouldn't do that. Let's uh, go over here. Uh, did you throw it in the lounge? Is that him? Where's that one? Um, uh, I mean, I've, I've you sent the link to me. I mean. If you really want to sort of do that, you know, next level kind of shit, like, you know, waking up, open your eyes and, you know, really sort of see the big picture kind of stuff, 
If you're kind of like, ah, you know what, I don't want to deal with this kind of shit, Brian, then, you know, it's certainly not required. But uh, Shane shared with me a really cool video. I was so really surprised with this guy. Traditional He's called uh, the, the Leo astrology. King. Traditional astrology doesn't... Um, uh, it actually is funny. He even talks through this speech about how the people in the celestial sort of community were giving him shit over him giving himself this name. But anyway, that's here nor there. Um, but I have to tell you, man, it's, it's damn impressive listening to this guy. And I think it's going sort of, you know, like how the uh, the Indian culture thinks of us as the uh, different Vedas or Vegas or Vedas or whatever. I'm probably totally butchering that. And how there are like different, literally different states of the human species and how we are enlightened, but then we go through a regression period. And, you know, thankfully, I think they call them the Yugas. Uh, we're coming out of a really dark one. It's just, we're just starting to wake up. We're just starting to open our eyes. So, you know, like I said, you know, the, the advent of things like the internet and stuff like that, you know, that, that might be sort of the way that the public actually starts to see the big picture that I think the banksters have known all along, you know, since, you know, 14th century or whatever. And they've just sort of taken advantage of this information. But now, maybe, if we're really lucky, you know, uh, through the 2000 peak, I didn't hear anybody talking about this at all. Um, and I watched it all play out, and I was just absolutely stunned at how through 2001 and 2002, that entire dot-com bubble euphoria world just evaporated. So that's one thing that has me very worried for crypto right now. And sort of this unicorn, high tech, you know, also that, um, you know, MMT, you'll own nothing but be perfectly happy. That kind of thinking, I think, is not realistic. And I'm wondering whether the 1% is just laying the biggest fucking trap possible here. Uh, that's my major message to the world, is I feel like the 1% is trying very hard. They've, they've engineered it in society beautifully here to get you out of your equity at exactly the bottom in equity. Or think of it also this way. Uh, we move through this, what we like to call that gold uh, Dow ratio cycle. Uh, and you've probably seen images. Um, you know, if we go uh, Dow gold ratio. Uh, you've probably, and you know, anybody's taking the class program, right? You've, you've seen me, you know, talk about these swings back and forth. Um, this is the exact point at which uh, equity or paper assets are basically being thrown away um, in preference for hard assets, commodities, physical assets. Uh, and I think it's a trap. So I don't know. We'll see what happens. Um, you know, one way to sort of see that in this new modern age, this is kind of nice dovetail, is uh, this, I think, well, and I've, I've done this in these public videos before, but I think it's a good dovetail uh, for the level oneers here this week. This is, uh, in essence, last cycle's uh, asset to get out of the system, to leave, to not be part of the paper asset world. Uh, through the uh, late 60s and through the 1970s, commodity investing itself uh, was actually a relatively new thing, actually very similar to the way crypto and, and online investing in crypto is now. It's pretty much almost identical, which is freaky. And I don't see more people in our society talk about this. This really puzzles me. Why there aren't more of these old timers making this connection here? Is it a conspiracy? Does somebody not want us talking about this similarity? Because I think, you know, remember, I was a commodities broker. So, I mean, I knew the commodities industry and its history backwards. 
I was a commodities trader held back in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, so, you know, it behooved me to learn, you know, what was Kenny Roberts, my mentor at that time? What was his history? When did he start his business? What was the market like? Like I said, in the 1970s, investing in commodities and, you know, condominiums, right? These were, these were brand new concepts. Um, so I think that the baby boomers, through their respective fear cycle, use the commodity markets and investing in commodities the same way the crypto kids are using Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies to get out of the system now. And, you know, our old thesis gold-Dow uh, ratio, if you look at this gold-Dow ratio, it does a very, very consistent behavioral pattern over like, you know, like centuries, not just like you know, 10, 20 years, this is actually very normal behavioral pattern. And all this is, is just simply measuring the desire to own hard assets versus the desire to own paper assets. It's not really like there's any specific price point on any of these assets in this image. It has nothing to do with specific price at all. And it has everything to do with what is the preference for society at that given point in time for paper or hard assets. And that's the most important thing I think you have to take away from this. Because, you know, we look at Bitcoin prices right now and you're like, $30,000, woohoo, you know. But... What happens if the Dow goes to 100,000, 200,000? Maybe Bitcoin goes to 100,000. I mean, there's a, probably a perfect example. Let's say Bitcoin goes to 100,000, you know, it's a happening routine. But the Dow goes to 200,000, 300,000, 400,000, whatever. I mean, in this crazy for crazy world. So my message too. And this is a pretty important message because, you know, for the past five years, I've been playing in this crypto space with you guys with the basic message being I'm bullish of commodities. I'm bullish of hard assets. And I have to tell you, it is the exact opposite now. I am bullish of paper assets, not hard assets. So, is there an example where you're like, well, okay, Brian, I mean, uh, I'm still a Bitcoin bull and fuck you on uh, on uh, giving up on Bitcoin. I mean, I'm always going to be a Bitcoin bull. But I want to show you an image that really drives home what I'm trying to show you here. I don't know whether you'll get this or not. You might, you might not. But uh, I shared this with the uh, the class here this morning. Which assets, one is a paper asset, the other is the commodity. Which asset did better over the past year? I mean, you tell me. Which, if you want to make money from trading, which asset would you rather belong? This is actually the same uh, conversation as uh, investing in gold itself or investing in shares in gold mining companies. Um, I might argue, ironically enough, even in a uh, growth cycle, which I think that we are heading in, um, Investing in the shares of the gold companies gives you a far bigger rate of return than investing in gold itself. Um, and, you know, this is a very simple illustration of the difference in rate of return versus, uh, you know, um, th this is, and keep in mind, like I believe that this cycle actually started, actually this is kind of a good comparison. Because I actually think this growth cycle, and you know, if I ever write a book and all that kind of crap, I think that the, actually, yeah, this is perfect, right? Because I think that this cycle actually, this was the end of the last fear cycle here, and actually, this makes perfect sense. 
where equity does nothing, right, if we look at this, but the commodity outperforms. I mean, this equity's there. Now we're in a growth cycle, and actually the exact opposite can happen, right? And I just measured from that March low from last year, right, right there. Uh, so, you know, I would, uh, I would, it's not necessarily like I'm saying that the Dow is better than Bitcoin or, you know, um, um, or gold is better than Bitcoin or pork bellies are better than Bitcoin. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying for the next 15 years is I think you're going to do better uh, you will outperform in paper assets versus the actual physical commodity. So, uh, what do you think? Uh, any level oneers on the call? Does that help a little bit in understanding sort of relative performance and why I like paper assets over a commodity asset? I mean, maybe both of them are long term bullish. Uh, but I think I'm going to get bigger bang out of my buck out of the paper market than, than the physical market. So, food for thought. Um, you know, I hate to say it. Uh, anybody who watches my videos over time, I mean, come on, people. <laughs> this is where it gets painful. Uh... What letters of the alphabet do you see there? I mean, yeah, I guess you could say there were M's there, but there wasn't any M here. But are we getting M? I mean, this is an M within an M within an M, and now this is an M in the underlying commodity. My my absolute first and foremost uh, suggestion is don't fight this. It's going to be painful. Uh, you can see where this thing W down here. That's where you should have been interested and look how long it took to go through this period of consolidation. You know, it is that's basically about six months. I mean, could we take six months and just clean this up a bit? Sure, why not? Just price. And that's the irony of all of this. That's what actually kills me about all this, is people will actually take like personal sort of uh, offense <laughs> when I say uh, you know price is gonna move up price is gonna move down uh, but you know I mean yeah, this is just a clothesline basis right if anything this is a nice simple image for you um, the most simplest thing to always think about here oh always 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 uh, remember I made reference to Kenny Roberts there earlier Number one thing he taught me was uh, you should always, you know, just as playing for a position of strength, just ask yourself what is a 50% rule? Um, so then percentages. Well, and you know, that's also an interesting point, too, right? Uh, we're you're probably going to want to watch year on year rates of return here. I wouldn't be surprised, actually, if Bitcoin finishes 2021 right around that mark. That wouldn't surprise me. But I could very easily see us just oscillate all around here for the next year. It's going to be painful. But uh, the simplest tool you can possibly ever use to just keep you honest in any market is what they call the 50% rule. So if somebody just off the street said, well, Brian, where do you think this thing's going to go? I would say, well, you know, it's 22,000 looks like a pretty good shot. And they usually say it happens in about half of the time it took this move. So if we go, I mean, these are just really simple sort of rules of thumb. You can kind of just keep in your back pocket. Is that, you know, and obviously nothing's guaranteed in this game. But if you were just going to try and think, okay, what is 50% um, of that up move? It's about 51 or 52 bars. And uh, I've done this with you guys before on these free videos, so it's not really rocket science, something like that. So Mr. Gann would say, eh, if this market was healthy and natural and normal, we should probably be there at some point, not too distant future. Um, 
Got a little fast trend line working here off of this market structure, so I think that's valid. And interestingly enough, uh, you know, if we just use this clothesline basis, I might even draw a channel. Uh, let's go boo, ba doo and you could draw it off of that point. So that actually explains the traffic area right now. Hell, I mean, you can go off of that point. That's perfectly valid. And, of course, the bears will hate me. I mean, technically, you could go off of there, but I guess the bulls would hate me on that one. But that's probably a pretty good level, that last pivot low there. So, you know, if I was somebody said, well, you know, what do you think the uh, – current sort of price channel is, I would just say, well, I use that market structure, and I don't know whether I've drawn this right or not. It looks messy. Uh, and then we'll just go off of that low, and that's probably the cadence of our move. So, and actually this, uh, I think I even said this to other people uh, publicly. We might actually come down here, clean itself up, and I might set up a bot setup. All right, something like that. As long as we hit this level here, then if over time we start making like one low, two lows, three lows, and hey, <laughs> we can start getting bullish again. And the problem here in this crazy facazy world is, I mean, what does that mean? Just another trillion dollar stimulus package? Kaboom! And well, what to one trillion? Let's make it two trillion. Two trillion? Let's make it four trillion. Four trillion? Ah, fuck you. I can do better than that. Let's go ten trillion. No, no. Twenty trillion dollars. <laughs> I mean, does it does it matter? Uh, oh God, what a nightmare we're living in, eh? Hmm. So let me um leave that image on the screen while I fill my coffee up. I just want you to think about that. I mean, would would you have been a buyer of gold up top here? Eight hundred dollars had to wait twenty years. Say so it's even start to come back. Never did. Could we have a ten twenty year period here? Well, relatively speaking, commodities maybe have to take a bit of a pause as the millennials go through their life cycle? I don't know. All right, I'm gonna fill up my coffee. All right, I think it's important, too, to mention with this image here that this is not implying that Bitcoin's going to go down. Oh, Bitcoin could bottom today and keep going up. And yet this will, by nature, come back down to earth. You're probably going to see this crazy marathon be $300 a share <laughs> tomorrow. And what a coincidence, right? Klaus is trying to get everybody out of the market. Sell all your equity. You don't want to own anything. Go into debt. <laughs> At exactly the time when you don't want to do that. You want to own equity. Pay off all your debts. Neither a debtor nor a lender be. Load up on equity and sit back the next 10, 20 years. I think you get fucking stinking rich. Right, what's the expression? Own 32 Ethereums and it'll pay your income for the rest of your life. But don't give those Ethereums to fucking Klaus. Jerk. I can't believe how blatant the 1% is through all of this. It really pisses me off. And, I mean, it really does. I mean, not only... I think, you know, they got the banksters and fucking, you know, I think Trump was in on it from day one, but that's just me. Um, you know, just fucking ju juice this fear cycle right into that Jupiter-Saturn cross. I mean, just get them freaking out. Didn't have to be that way. Doesn't anybody fucking in our society take some responsibility? 
Be good stewards? Think about your fellow humans? What the hell happened? <laughs> yeah, I know, Colleen. Like, what the fuck? What happened? To, what, why do we have to live this reality? Who, who made these rules? I, I don't get it. I thought we are What happened to that Jesus guy saying, you know, do unto others and all that kind of shit? What happened? Oh, I know. <laughs> Two words. Uh, 1913. <laughs> That's a clue I'll give you. Anyway, the good part about this is, like I said, uh, we at TRI try and stand outside the box. You don't have to be part of the box. Right, so uh, where's that uh, Mara? Uh, that Mara is a perfect example of us being outside the box. Uh, I don't like any of this, the way that the uh, banksters have fucked us all over and basically diluted our countries. Um, you know, I mean, in essence, they used to say that your your uh, your country's currency is your basically your country's capital. So, in essence, these banksters have basically stolen all of our society's capital. Oh, thank you, banksters. Appreciate it. Um, but at the same time, too, I hope you appreciate looking at an mm -hmm. image like this. This is us acknowledging that these guys are crooks. There's not really much we can do about it. Um, so how are you, are, are you going to just bury your head in the sand or are you going to try and at least take advantage of it? So, uh, you know, here is a perfect example where, you know, all of us at TRI, um, I think we're long from uh, down in this area, down in here on this stock. We'll just keep banging out doubles as it keeps going higher. Uh, and of course, we got tons of these kind of stocks. Uh, you know, I was showing the kids in the uh, in the class today the blink, right? I mean, I'm not fucking a rocket science to a scientist. You all know that. But uh, you know, my trading plan and everything that I do said, "Hey, Brian, uh, pay attention uh, down here." Okay, you know, I'll just keep banging out doubles, and I still got more stock on the books. <laughs> <laughs> so if they want to keep taking this thing out, well, they're warrants, but if they want to keep taking this thing higher, I got more to sell them. Um, so this is us acknowledging that, you know, the banksters have screwed us all over. But are we just going to stand there and take it or are we going to do something about it and take advantage of this fakazy, crazy world? Uh, and, you know, I mean, if anything... If you can make capital gains at a faster rate that the, the banksters can dilute your currency and you can make a capital gain at a faster rate than your government can steal your money through taxes, well, are you not technically ahead? <laughs> so that's our solution is, all right, well, you know, they're running at 20 miles an hour. Fine, we got to run at 30 miles an hour. <laughs> they just upped it. Oh, and here comes a whole new set of taxes. They just upped it to 25 miles an hour. All right, we got to run at 35 miles an hour. And that's how you stay ahead in this world. Sucks, but hey, if you don't, you're going to get run over and left behind. Sucks. <laughs> Anyway, get long equity. Don't let fucking Klaus uh, con you into uh, selling your equity. That's the one dangerous thing through all of this. Uh, what's that? So somebody says, I'm confused. Bearish BTC, bullish ETH. Um, yeah, maybe. You know, I think I said in my recent uh, public messages, long range crypto, I'm not really bearish. I just. I can't be bullish right now. You know, I'll just wait for the uh, euphoria to die down. You know, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's Bitcoin or Ethereum, especially Ethereum. I mean, this is nuts. How can you possibly... I mean, there's a big M there. I mean, it's staring you in the face. Don't deny it, people. Um, but uh, Ethereum, I put out charts like this. I mean, this this is chaos right now. I mean, no offense, but nobody in the public should be touching this thing right now. we got to figure out what the hell it wants to do. 
if you want to be a buyer of these kind of assets, you got to force yourself to come in when it's looking like this, right? This is what we call a narrow sideways channel. And at least here, if you buy here, you're saying, okay, it, it looks to me like this is a range. So if I'm going to buy there, I'll risk against there. And if it craps out and loses this range, okay, fine. You know, the trade idea didn't work. You know, you can clearly see the range held and away we go. How the, f I mean, how do you do that with price the way it is right now? I mean, where's your range? This is just insanity. Yeah, of course, everybody's going to come in and say, oh, yeah, we're going to a million dollars. Uh, Ethereum's going to be higher price than Bitcoin soon. Oh, okay, fine. Uh, you know, as a professional risk taker, remember, I, I want my account balances to go up. I, I'm i not here just fucking, you know, spin the wheel. Let's see what happens. I'm here expecting my account balance to go up. I don't know what the fuck's going to happen here. This is chaos. We could be just like, you know, middle of last week, we even said, oh, okay, fine, we're going to take it higher, great. And then, you know, everybody was probably like, woo, this is it, we're going to the man. And then, bam, did they get their asses kicked and stopped out and blah, margin called and all that? Probably. Is this it? Could there be a few more of these before this event? Sure, why not? I mean, hey, have you got a coin in your pocket? Uh, is there such a thing as an Ethereum coin? Does that exist? Flip it. <laughs> the odds of you being right versus you actually looking at this chart are probably, you know, that's the worst part about this is that if you make a decision, you're going to be sort of importing your own personal bias into this. And we always say, if you come to the market without sort of like a setup and everything all vetted out and stuff, and you're actually looking at the market going, hmm, should I buy, should I sell? You're actually setting yourself up for disaster because uh, usually the market goads you into thinking the exact wrong thing at the exact wrong moment. That's, that's what the market is designed to do. So when I look at something like this, this just says hands off, don't touch. Simple as that, it sucks, but anyway, it is what it is. Uh, if we do get big blasts off up top, obviously everybody at TRI is long Ethereum. They're going to fucking have an, <laughs> probably an orgy on the spot. Orgy, orgy, orgy. Uh, and you never know. They, you know, Don't get into the business of predicting what's going to happen in the future because I'll tell you, most people that do go into that business go out of that business very quickly. Um. I, if we do get the pull back down into reload zones against original market structure, blah, 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 value, all that, I could entertain investing, but I can't touch it here. Which sucks, you know, because, I mean, this area, that's like six, seven hundred bucks. And here we are, like, what, 13? That's like 50% discount. So I can't really do anything there. It's a mess. Um, on the corn, I'm a little disappointed. I mean, that is a very well-defined M. Uh, there's no denying it, people. Um, even if there wasn't an M in there in place, you probably have listened and heard me long enough that what I really need, like I just said there on like the Ethereum, is what I need to see is some sort of consolidation, something to give me a range that I can sort of take a risk against. And of course, you know how much I love my W's. <laughs> so, you know, just this new low onto itself after just confirming an M. There's no way in hell I could even consider coming in on the buy side here. And oh, by the way, it looks like we just actually confirmed an inside bar sell signal there. Uh-oh. I suppose, I, you know, on the site lower time frames, we're having fun. This is a fun little... I've been able to... Uh, David O showed us how to write on uh, lines now. For years, I couldn't do this, and it used to drive me crazy. So now I'm just fucking <laughs> just <laughs> trend, line, trend line writing like crazy, just having so much fun with this. But this is such a cool, simple illustration of um, how you trade with trend lines, right? And, you know, up trend lines. You know, if I get an M below that trend line, look out. 
So that's what this one was, right? That line, that line. Oh, there's an M. So actually, this cell signal fired yesterday. Yeah, it's just been working away. And it's fascinating how we came up to this trend line, put in an M right there. I don't know whether that would be enough of an M for me. My hunch is it's probably a nice little counter trend rally. And then if we failed, that would be a signal. But I don't know, man. That sure looks like an M there, right? So anyway, this is the one that fired yesterday. So I've just been watching this as it works away. But um, I think I even said recently, I mean, that there is that M there. And I guess one of the reasons why I didn't think this was a bottom yet was um, one of these charts. One of these, yeah, this one here. Um, a site member actually sent me this message recently, I was asking. And I don't think this ABCD level's been hit yet. And I'm worried whether that was one of these crazy liquidity pool kind of setups. So I got a whole bunch of the crypto kids. They all got their stops right below there. Oh, Jesus, does this M come in here? Dump down, break their hearts. Oh, hey boy, rinse and repeat, do it all over again. And actually, this now is actually setting up a bearish bot, eh? One high, two highs, three highs, four highs. Oh, boy, I can see the bot set up forming now. So that's probably not a good thing. Something like that. Then we will go bot set up. 33, 66. And we will put that over there. So if you were short inclined, entirely up to your plan. Um, boom. Hey, what a coincidence. Look how that bot level sits up perfectly off that market structure level. That's insane. Uh, <laughs> it's so funny when you see that happen. So uh, clearly the market's interested in this level, eh? So these were uh, bearish objectives, you can see, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. These were a couple big bearish objectives that had to be hit. They were hit. So think of that sort of like chaos. Once that's been happened, there's kind of a vacuum in the market. And I had said last week when I did sort of free videos that I felt like this was sort of like a dead cat bounce. Uh, it's interesting how the dead cat did bounce right to 38.2 and then start to fail again. And we say, can't really judge a move until 38.2 has been resolved. So this is a good example of the bottom, dead cap bounce, and in comes a whole bunch of bearish market structure. And that bearish market structure actually looks like it sets up a stab down to about 24.8 here, which would validate this. And my hunch is this is probably like an alt ABCD. Remember we were doing those alt ABCDs on the way up? So it's probably the same thing here. Uh, let's see, we want to go here to here. And we want to go extensions. And then we want to draw that off of here to here. So 100% is there. 1.272, that's a typical Alt ABCD objective. That's 25.1. And that uh, 24 uh, 8 area. I like that. That's not a bad objective. So it's just kind of interesting how um, the market, after it smiled, how it reacted following that smile, how we're putting in all these M's here. That That's fascinating. Um, and like I said, uh, you know, ironically enough, the uh, trend line trader, they actually strapped on a short on this M here below this trend line. Um, and yesterday was just a big hurry up and do nothing. And interesting how just in the past hour they dumped it to new lows there. So, you know, the, the trend line trader, this is, again, the same sort of thing. We don't really give a shit about, you know, oh, I think the market's going up. I think the market's going down. You're just trading the trend lines. And every single trade, you notice here, should be uh, 2.0, right? Two to one risk reward. So it's not even really like you even give a shit about what's happening. You're just getting a signal. Let's see if I can show you that. Uh, two to one, two to one, right? Two to one. I don't see any reason. It looks like we got a big honking trend line down here that wants to get tagged as well, whatever that is. So I don't see any reason why this can't dump down into here. It seems perfectly logical. You know. So anyway, uh, you know, like we, uh, this is so funny because markets do do this and it pisses people off to no end. 
Um, but, you know, we might find that just as, uh, you know, we did this back in um, uh, this uh, top here. All right. Back we rallied up and then we just grind our way lower. I wouldn't be surprised if the next year or two looks something along these lines. That wouldn't surprise me. The only question I have here is what's sort of the cadence of this correction? And that brings me to uh, this image. Uh, I was absolutely stunned by the way the market ran up, hit this upper arc here. All right, clearly it needed to do that and then stopped. Um, I've been thinking for a while now that uh, the corn likes to move in these like sort of, eh, it's weird. It's sort of like two year patterns where you get like a bull pattern, then a bear pattern, then a bull pattern, then a bear pattern. And within the bull and bear patterns, you have bull cycle or bear cycle, bull cycle, bear cycle, bull cycle, bear cycle, bull cycle. And it's actually very consistent. I was quite surprised. What I did notice though, is sometimes these bull and bears seem to shift back and forth. You know, like here, um, and I, like I said, I think that this was political. Um, but, you know, well, we'll see after the fact. I, I don't think Bitcoin was supposed to do this uh, through this period. I really don't. I think what was supposed to happen here was from this reset point, we were supposed to go sideways through this period and then head into that Fakazi move. But something disconnected here. And like I said, I think it has everything to do with politics. Anyway, now that this cycle has been reversed, and I still think these two-year patterns are accurate, I, it just feels to me like we probably have to do a year of sort of sideways. And actually, that would make perfect sense. You can see, you know, a year of sideways. This is actually one year high to one year low, exactly one year. Could we see one year high to, you know, even just come down and retest the old highs? Whoa, whoa, whoa. that would be shocking. <laughs> we just trade back to the old all-time highs. By the way, corn has done that a few times. Um, over the next year, I actually like that. I don't think we're leaving the money printing, quantitative easing, uh Nobody has any confidence in the system. I don't think we're leaving that conversation anytime soon. But at the same time, too, holy for holies, that's like 45,000, right? And this is now what, you know, 20 some odd thousand. Oops. Uh, so we got ourselves a pretty juicy trading range. And as I said, you know, this is a weekly basis. What I want to see for me to be a bull, of course, is hey, how about those W things? Could it take until here for this to eventually turn and start moving back up sure that's not unrealistic to me i wonder you know uh i don't know whether bitcoin is the one that actually gives us the insane cool buy here i think it's more ethereum but that's just sort of my two cents actually you know what i've been blabbing away way too long here um, I, I'm just gonna leave the sort of bigger picture rhetoric at that for today. Um, and what I'm thinking about happening with coin. I mean, it should be pretty obvious. I'm not thinking like, like I said, I'm not bearish. I'm just not bullish. I'm unbullish right now. That's, that's the way I would be thinking of this. And of course, reload zones, all that kind of stuff. If we get dips back down into cost of production, that's, um, uh, Shane's chart. Shane has such a cool chart. Anyway, I have one uh, Shane chart. It actually might be. Uh, darn. Yeah, it's this one. This is it. So, uh, oh, you. Um, you know, I like to use the S17s and the S19s as sort of your base cost of production. I'm sure there's S15s and 13s and 11s and 10s and 9s and 6s and whatever still mining away. My hunch is probably over the next year these two sort of come together. 
But I wonder if uh, we could potentially uh, be in that 2000, this kind of year. I could see this, right? That's sort of that same sort of sideways pattern for a year, and then we start our march back up higher again. So I don't know whether we're going to get that deep reload zone pullback. I, I just, I got a funny feeling it's not going to happen on Bitcoin. Anyway, that's my hunch. The market I do like for that to happen here is on um, good old Ethereum. If, if this thing can pull back down into these long-term reload zones, I think this is the buying opportunity of the next generation. So that's the way I'm sort of approaching this space right now. Yeah, where are we here? Um, yeah, I like that. You know, if, the, if I was going to be in that, and also too, this, this I think speaks as well to, you know, what is crypto? Is crypto a, a hard asset commodity proxy? Or is it a growth asset, paper asset, you know, Shane's Air World, uh, you know, uh, ERC-20 tokens? I don't know. Um, my hunch actually is that this this particular proxy and all its different sort of spinoffs, go check out Chico Crypto. He loves talking about all these different things that are happening in this space. Uh, I think this actually outperforms Bitcoin. So I know that there's some current level oneers who are kind of asking, okay, well, where does crypto fit into this? I think initially the story is crypto was a beautiful sort of get me the fuck out of the system uh, proxy. And I think, you know, the millennials, man, they bought that story hook, line, and sinker. Right? Uh, it worked perfectly. But in a weird sort of way, you know, again, remember, you might find stock prices just fucking go apeshit relative to Bitcoin. Bitcoin still goes up, but stocks and equities go fucking in nuts in this Fakazi world. That's usually what happens. I mean, the Brazilian stock market was at just absolutely insane levels uh, when it went through its hyperinflation. The stocks were just going through the roof. So, uh-oh, uh what's this? Morpheus Network partnering with Coca-Cola. Everyone is front-running the announcement. Oh, boy, there you go. Um, actually, you know, like uh, Decentraland, they uh, announced that Atari was going to have a deal with them. Like, fuck me, talk about growth. Library credits, you know, as sort of an alternative to YouTube. Oh, my goodness, what a growth story. So... I can see crypto as a growth proxy, so it'd be fascinating. I don't think this is the end story for crypto by a long shot. Um, I, 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 yeah, I mean, you millennials, it's beautiful to watch you in action. Hell, now, uh, we were even joking on the site, but I think it's got trouble written all over it. Now the uh, the the crypto kids they want to take over the stock market and they're they're doing like stock proxies for for uh, for stocks like Tesla and stuff on uh, on DeFi and I'm like oh this this has got trouble written all over just leave that shit alone just stay in DeFi land stay in crypto land you know like uh, Sjord's LTO I love that LTO story talk about a growth story so that's the kind of shit that's gonna make you fortunes. Uh, where's his little LTO? I mean, this is a perfectly good story. Again, what's the fundamental drivers? I mean, great looking chart, higher highs and higher lows. Just don't get in its way. But what, what, why would someone use your blockchain? And it might have absolutely nothing to do with store of value. It might be, well, you know, this is a far more efficient way for our customer base to do remittance, right? And boom! Your story goes 10x, 100x. <laughs> like this stake. I got myself a free position in this. I, oh, Jesus, Brian. I got to fucking get to what I'm supposed to be doing here today, and that is I'm supposed to be answering questions. Um, where do we put that uh, Q&A document? Um, uh, probably... Uh, Kevin and Shaktoshi and stuff, they probably left by now because I'm just babbling away forever. Uh, 
Where can I find? Oh, uh, I wouldn't be in that room. Maybe in the level one classroom. Is that where you guys put it? Bob Collins. Bob Collins has got the link for me right here. And I think I could probably get it here as well. And I know you guys have a ton of questions. Right? So it's 1230. Um, I have to be out of here by 230 for Liam. So uh, hopefully I have enough time to have a shower. Boy. <laughs> Wish me luck. Okay, today's 24th. Uh, yeah. Okay, so here we go. In the document called Creating Strategists, there's a section that says, for example, given our newfound understanding of demographic influence, it's now easier to understand why interest rates are low and the trend has been down. Bets on rising interest rates have literally been like sailing into the wind. Yeah, <laughs> I'd have to say that. But in the B recent BCS, Brian talks about how he thinks that it's likely that interest rates start rising. Why? Uh, well, I remember I wrote this document back in 2012, 2013. So that was like literally five years ahead of that cycle pivot. We are now at the cycle pivot. <laughs> and now we have to expect 35 years of rising interest rates. Oh, wonderful. Uh, let's see if we can go like long-term interest rate cycles. So I don't even know that we can show you this. Uh, something like this. This is just over uh, since the 1790s. You can see, remember kind of like that Dow gold ratio. You can see the cycles. Uh, and we just went through a major troughing period. Now, is it going to be as bad as 1980? I don't think so. Uh, if anything, I think we're probably in like maybe one of these little blurps. And like there, blurp. Um, we would want to rally off the lows and then come back down and test the lows. And then if we bottom out, then all hell is going to break loose our interest rates. So, uh, you know, if you look at the interest rate chart right now, this is just bigger picture, like going back, you know, a couple hundred years. All I really want you to take away from this is pivot, 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 pivot. Interest rates do not move in one direction forever. And this is why I think, you know, like sort of that 1% is conning the public. This whole MMT kind of thinking is they basically believe that interest rates are going to go down forever and never go the other direction. But you can see from this chart, that's just not the way the world works. So what I'm fearful of, and like I said, when I wrote that uh, piece, I wrote it like here. And in 2012, 2013, yeah, we had another good five, ten years of falling interest rates, rising bond prices ahead of us. But that's kind of changing. It's not, you know, kind of like Bitcoin. It's probably not in our best interest to be looking for the pivot today. But, you know, here is now that uh, long-term bond chart. Um, maybe not the best M in there just yet. Could we come back up and test that high? Could be. You know, if you look at the actual candles, this high, that was the COVID crisis high. Uh, you know, you can clearly see the M in here now. My hunch is kind of like Bitcoin. You know, we have to be thinking at some point. You know, keep in mind this is this is now going back since nineteen or uh, yeah, nineteen ninety nine, basically the turn of the century there. So that was that entire uh, fear cycle, and just like all the other charts that we do, nothing changes here. At some point, you know, when you start seeing Ws, hey, you got to be thinking this is bullish. If we start seeing Ms, we got to be thinking bearish, and just like I did with Bitcoin, it's the same logic here. The natural level where this market really wants to be is actually right in here. Now, if bond prices come back to the 50% level of just this very natural range, you can see it was a high. There's a swing up here, swing down here, swing here. 
this is sort of close, but you can see this, is a, this looks like a pretty important level to the market. Um, so if prices do want to come back down to here, what does that mean about interest rates? Anyone? If bond prices are going down, which direction does that mean interest rates are going? That's right. So the problem here is that you're looking at this chart. Remember, MMT people, they're saying, nope, this is straight up. It will never come back down again. I mean, you can see where the market was smiling here and what happened. And we had to wait for it to W out before interest rates stopped going up and started going down again. I mean, there's a little M right there. I mean, you have to wait for it to actually W out, and then we can start thinking lower interest rates. So we got an M working there. I can't think of interest rates actually not going up or bond prices going up until I get some sort of W here. There, that, that, just that M just confirmed. So this is what I mean, whoever's asking the question, what I see happening here. Now remember, like I said, I wrote that document actually right in here. <laughs> That's where I wrote that document. And that was a pretty good thesis. But remember, according to Brian's thesis, this cycle changed right there. And actually, I think this was not real. Remember, that was COVID. I think COVID actually caught the market off guard. What I was expecting was market rallies up against this high, M's out, and that long-term interest rate cycle starts cleaning itself up. COVID? took us to new highs, and like I said, I think that caught the whole world off guard. You look at the Bitcoin chart. It was just stunning how, I don't you know, there's nothing wrong with Bitcoin. Bitcoin price just fell off a cliff there, uh, just along with everybody else. Everybody just went, holy fuck. <laughs> so anyway, so uh, I hope that helps answer that question. You know, like I said, uh, the lectures were actually recorded back here when we were going through that. And really what that means is now that we actually have made this cycle transition, I gotta go and fucking re-record all those lectures. Boo. <laughs> oh well. Uh, anyway, I hope that uh, helps uh, answer that question to a certain degree. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, where's where did that document go? I got over here. Oh, by the way, uh, some people in the level one were asking about sort of Brian's crazy language. We actually threw this uh, cute little uh, uh, isms document in the library. So if you happen to hear me talk about anything, I'll put it in the lounge again. Or actually, here, we'll put it in the level one room again, just in case you need it. But it's in the library. <coughs> I wanted to make reference to that before I left. Um, you know, like, uh, where do we expect to see growth going forward? This is a good example. Uh, you know, if we look at, say, something like Canada. The good part about Canada, of course, there's a lot of people that want to move here. But if you look at the Canadian demographic situation, actually, that's not, oh, 1950. <laughs> so in 1950, can you see lots of young people, not many old people? Is that economy ready to grow? I think so. And actually, if we look at Canada now, not many young people, lots of old people. Is that problematic? Yes. So it's just, that's a really good example of demographics. So, you know, if we want to think about what are the economies and stuff that are going to grow, grow going forward, really we want to look for that demographic situation where you've got uh, lots of young people, not many old people. So, you know, it's interesting uh, for the strategic vision, right? We have to start, we have to sit here and ask ourselves, who's going to grow in the future? Is it actually realistic thinking about what just happened with North America and the way it went through its demographics? And you look at that image, that looks like Canada from 1950. And you know what happened in the uh, North American economy since 1950. How about China? What's China's demographic look like? It's not bad. 
It's a little bit light on the young population. This is, what, five years ago. It's not as bad as the West. You know, got really screwed through this was uh, Japan. And the problem is Japan, I mean, they don't like foreigners. So, actually, this is interesting. What's this? Uh, hmm, don't know what year that is. Uh, what do we got here? So there's 2017. You can see their economy is not set up to grow. It's actually uh, kind of top heavy. Actually, it's uh, that looks better than it used to, than it used to look. So really, if you're thinking about where you want to invest and what you want to see uh, grow, so there's a good example: Japan in 1960. Do you see how it was set up to grow? So, you know, thinking, uh, and it's interesting because there's guys like uh, that Raul Paul guy. He's all super bullish of uh, India and all those uh, Indian Ocean countries. And frankly speaking, I can understand why. You know, they are set up to grow. And the interesting thing is, is China better watch its P's and Q's or there's going to be a serious dust up between those two countries in the not too distant future. And it might have absolutely nothing to do with us in the West. It'll be interesting to see what happens. All right, uh, let's keep moving forward here. Uh, whoops. Oh, now where'd we go? Uh, what did I do with that document? <laughs> so great. Uh, not that one. That one? No. That one? No. That one? No. 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 Oh, great. I lost it. Huh. Oh, here it is. Wow. Too many. All right. Oh, boy. We're going to be here a while. <laughs> what time is it? 12.39. All right. got to get this done in an hour because uh, there are no excuses for Liam. Okay. Uh, the same document says that we should expect the next part of the current demographic cycle to be a fear peak, probably around Q317. Could March of this year have been that peak? Actually, if you look at, like, the U.S. dollar index is the world's hegemony currency, and ironically enough, the U.S. dollar index did bottom exactly where we were supposed to. So there is the bottom, and uh, what I thought was basically our pivot right through here. So we're holding those lows. We'll see what happens. Um, and my general hunch, feeling, pro you know, prognostication thesis is we actually turn up from here. So we'll see what happens. Only time will to hell. Um, hasn't really turned yet. Uh, but I suppose if we get a trade up through these highs, we might be starting to talk about things like inverted head and shoulders off the lower time frame. Uh, and that sort of thinking, you know, like 10, 15 years down the road, this thing, I think, is going to be like up in here. Uh, and if you want to see a historical comparison, what did the U.S. dollar, uh, what did the U.S. dollar index do in 1980? Because in essence, that's exactly the same. You know, Jupiter, Saturn, Cross, all that kind of fun stuff. So coming out of that event, notice U.S. dollar bottoms, 1980, and look at what happened in 1981, 82, 83. This is all the way into 1985. So that's like a five-year period. If you're going to be bullish of something, would you want to be bullish of that? I think so. So that's ironically enough what I actually think is coming down the pike. <laughs> which, of course, nobody in the market is even contemplating, which I find hilarious. We'll see what happens. I, I hope you can understand that. If, you know, like I said, when somebody tried to teach me this stuff 20, 30 years ago, I had to go through the whole cycle and actually see the dot-com peak, See the university professors laughing at presidents of tech companies saying they're selling their stock and getting out at the top. I mean, literally, that was what a beautiful hallmark. Uh, some A university professor laughing at a company CEO on national television. I mean, how humiliating is that? And yet the university professor was the wrong one there. 
So I think it's the same sort of environment right now. You're probably looking around right now going, well, I don't see any signs around me, Brian, that this is right. And you're probably going to have to see it play out over the next 5, 10 years for you to actually believe me. Well, we'll see what happens. All right, moving on. Uh, what is the Great Reset? I don't know. Uh, the Great Reset is a marketing campaign. And what are its implications? Um... If the 1% can get as much equity out of you as possible, then they win, as usual. <laughs> Obviously, a very in-depth question, but last week's BCS perked my interest. Thanks. Uh, well, I'd say it. I mean, you know, that was really interesting. I saw a news article. Uh, not many people going to Davos this year. Uh, from what I understand, these uh, World Economic Forum clowns uh, relocated to some other city, and it turns out nobody actually likes Davos after all. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, I would say the Great Reset is a plot by the 1% to convince you that they're working on your best interest and your behalf, but in reality, they're trying to con you into some sort of belief system that serves their purposes. End of statement. Okay, uh, here are a few questions that I had a problem with on test one. What is the industry standard term with regard to central bank policy on short-term interest rates? Uh, what is the industry standard term with regard to central bank policy on short-term interest rate? Hmm. What is the industry standard term? <clears throat> Fed funds rate? I'm not quite sure. I'm not, uh, I'd have to know what the context of the uh, question was in. Graham, you're on the call. What's, uh, what's our answer here? Graham, are you here? There you are. Well, what are we looking for here? Monetary policy. Yeah, that would make sense. All right. So, in essence, there are two policies governments can um, carry. They can uh, adjust your taxes and they can adjust uh, spending. That's called fiscal policy. Uh, balance the budget, right? Monetary policy is something that's actually been sort of created out of the sort of 20th century. But interestingly enough, you could make the argument it goes back to all the way back to things like Knights Templar and tally sticks and all that. How do you actually uh, affect the supply of money in the economy to either encourage growth or encourage contraction? That is what's now affectionately called monetary policy and the central bankers given permission to control monetary policy, which in itself is highly dubious. Um, they, uh, they can uh, contract or limit or expand uh, the amount of credit and the cost of money in the marketplace. And so as a result, that policy will often um, affect the direction of the economy. Um, probably a really great way for you to understand uh, monetary policy is to uh, dig into the library um, and uh, Ray Dalio uh, put together some Pretty famous, well, famous in that, you know, lots of hits and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, lectures on, um, where the hell do we have it? I think it's on, yeah, in here, how markets work. Uh, on uh, what is a bond and how do bonds work? Uh, what is the yield curve and what does it tell investors? Um, what are bond spreads and tips versus TLT spreads? And then these are Ray's videos, how the economy works. And then, of course, the Money Masters uh, video, which is sort of the backdrop to Ray's conversation on how bankers control our economy. So that would be my direct suggestion is you have to sit down and watch all of these videos 
So we'll see you probably in about a week or two. Once you've watched them all, uh, taken lots and lots of notes, uh, then I think you'll probably understand how this whole damn thing works. I'm not going to say it's easy. I mean, 30 a year career, there's no way we're going to squeeze this all into one week. But we sure try hard. <laughs> now you spend the next year digesting all this shit. Okay, what has been the general theme of monetary policy through the current fear cycle? Obviously, dilution, money printing, quantitative easing, easy monetary policy, low short-term interest rates. What best describes the relationship between cryptocurrencies and gold? Yeah. What best describes the relationship? I would say that they are both commodities. Uh, I know you guys don't like that kind of talk, but that would be my general thesis. And then the question ultimately here for us going forward is, do cryptocurrencies morph into growth stories a la Ethereum, World's Computer, LTO, uh, you know, IBM's uh, interest in Stellar Lumens, Internet of Things, that kind of talk. So I hope that helps answer those questions. All right, talking about that we should consider crypto as a commodity. What do you think about that same cryptocurrency allowed to collect yields, farming, stacking, Andre G. Well, thank you, Andre, for at least putting your name down there. I appreciate that. Um, I think that cryptocurrencies are going through their evolutionary phase right now, kind of like what that Raul Paul says is, uh, you know, Bitcoin can't really be used as a, um, you know, a, a means of transit of, uh, you know, barter because uh, it's still going through its price discovery process. I really like that uh, line that he used. So I think that that's what's happening right now in this space is we're still trying to discover what, what what's doing what, who's doing who, how can this stuff work, which means that we're still very early in this story and there's still fortunes to be made on, you know, build a better mousetrap kind of thinking. But I'm worried that crypto is stepping on Wall Street's toes here to a certain degree. And Wall Street will not like its lunch being eaten. So, you know, framing, stacking, I'm not quite sure what those... Remember, I'm not the best crypto person to ask for, like, industry-specific terms... What I'm simply going to say is if your idea looks like it's stealing Wall Street's lunch, be careful. Um, you know, there are other people on the site like uh, Farmer Dave turned astronaut Dave turned, you know, well, whatever he is, Dave. Uh, those people are probably more informed uh, than me. Uh, oh, farm. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I'm not really the best person to ask about that. And right? I'm the type of guy, you come to me and say, well, Brian, I'm thinking about uh, running a small business of trading. Uh, how, how should I set myself up? Uh, I'm not the best person to, to ask about the future of crypto. All I will simply say is, you know, just if something seems too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, you know, if anything, crypto follows uh, technical chart patterns very, very well. So I think because of the algorithmic nature of cryptocurrencies in itself, it actually lends itself really well to technical analysis. Um, and I, you know, anytime I want to invest in something, I want to hear a half decent story. The thing is going to be used for this. Um, then I want to find out that, uh, you know, insiders, the, the smart money, they're buying, they're long from these levels. So I'm in basically the same as they are. Um, and, you know, what I really want to see is sort of limited supply. I think that's the one thing that killed these crypto kids. They just didn't understand this idea that you can't just unlimitedly print this shit. I mean, look what the U.S. dollar is going through right now. So... Anyway, so that's some uh, food for thought for you. 
All right, uh, could you please talk about the Dow Industrials with generational greed, fear cycles one more time? All right, well, I think I did that quite a bit there uh, in the past hour or two. It's shocking how it played out so far and that dump back then in March 2020. You can't write better fiction than reality. Yeah, pretty much. Can it be considered as a pivot for this new upcoming greed cycle? I think it actually was. You know, that's my honest opinion. I think that was the pivot. And a question I have with this concept, it is scary how it works so far and that things can be predicted so easily. Well, it's not really predicting. What we just want to do is we want to see the forest through the trees. Just try to understand that we humans, as we go through our life cycle, we have different preferences for different things. And as different generations sort of come online and take over economies, you will see monies flow in different directions. And that's really all this is. We're just trying to see those generational money flows. Uh, do, 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 do. If we will have another greed cycle, which is inflationary, why are you so bullish on USD? I think that this coming greed cycle is actually going to be historically looked at as another one of these low inflation environments. Uh, you know, interest rates move on very, very slow speed. So we're not going to be in that sort of 1980s hyperinflation uh, kind of double digit interest rates environment. That's not going to, uh, honestly, I don't think I'll be alive when that next is rampant. That That should be about... 30, 40 years from now. So I should be long gone. Um, so, ironic, like from my perspective, the, actually probably, we might be able to show you. Uh, <laughs> I was standing there because I was sitting too much. All right, so, um, where should we show you this? Uh, do, 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 do. I don't know. I think this goes back far enough. We'll see. Um. <gasps> mm. Yeah, no, we don't. Darn. So, uh, back in the, um, in the 40s and 50s, right? I think I actually that image that I had there, oh, this is a US dollar, how about uh, interest rates? Something like that. Uh, do, 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 do. What do I want to show you about? There's that chart. Can I not get any data going back 1950s? Hmm. I remember we were looking at this one, eh? So uh, this chart that I was just showing you here, right? Like you can't even see where the bottom of that is. But that's basically back here. So do you see how it's like 1940, 1950s? You see the double bottom there through the 1940s? That's... It's interesting that this image looks like this, right? And we're thinking about W's. I don't, can you can you see that W? I mean, it must be really hard to see on YouTube. But you can just Google uh, this and grab this image. I mean, I don't even know whose it is. We should thank uh, Barry Roth Holtz. <laughs> um, but I like the idea that we're in sort of something like this. And you can see that this is like a you know, five, ten year period. And really, interest rates, this is uh, this point right here, we're just back to 3%. So 
now, and that's like 1960. So in essence, this could be the next 10, 15 years where at most interest rates go back to like 3%. So, you know, we don't have to worry about this kind of shit. Thank heavens. We're in this saucer phase right now. Um, you know, they have a major deflationary problem. Like we've talked about that a lot. How long and how hard do they have to juice the system to get this thing to turn back up? You know, like somebody said that, uh, that you know, COVID. I, you know, you can see, like at this point, I was like, all right, sure looks like the bottom's in. But COVID <laughs> is one more little fuck you. And then I wouldn't be surprised, right? And there is 3%. Remember, we just showed you 3%. So I wouldn't be surprised if over the next 5, 10 years, we do something like that. Is that really going to make that big of a difference to a you and I? Probably not. The people that this really screws is like credit card debt and stuff like that. They're going to crank those rates through the roof. And if we get a move like this in the bond market, you know, banks will just simply stop lending. So somebody's got like five year paper, mortgages coming due, I've got to refinance. Oh, you can refinance. Yeah, your last one was at 5%, but this one, eh, we'll do you a favor. We're going to refinance at 15%. Oh, fuck you. I mean, that's how the whole damn 2008 financial crisis happened. And I thought it was really interesting because a guy that was telling me about some of the hallmarks of the top of the 2008 financial crisis, he's in the real estate business, and he's telling me, uh-oh, Brian, they're doing it again. So you can see the writing on the walls. It's coming, 100 miles an hour. And very slowly, it'll take probably five, 10 years to play out, but I can see the same things happening that we saw in 2008. Anyway, fun, fun, party, party. Okay, let's keep moving this train forward. Hope I helped answer that question a little bit. Um, where am I? Nope. Oh, I did this again. <laughs> I'm on the wrong page. Oh, no. I'm in page hell. Here we are. Over here. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so. Uh, okay, so I hope that helped explain that. Andre D, go pull up that chart of the U.S. dollar from 1980 through 85. That's what I think is going to happen. Uh, movement between and from cycle seems to be very important to take in consideration. You're telling me. If we are moving out of a fear cycle and into a greed cycle, how do we attribute the increase in stock prices equities in the past 10 years? And that is answered by uh, this image. Are you sure stock prices have gone up over the past 10 years? I don't think they have. So <clears throat> this, actually well, here we could probably even just do it now. This is your stock prices on a newspaper print basis. Man, that's a bull market. Oh, I'm getting rich. This is that same stock market in inflation adjusted basis. Well, it turns out actually nothing's doing anything. Uh, have the powers that be fucked with the system and fucked with the currency to pull this off? Yes. Is it fair to you and I? No. Does it line certain people's pockets? Yes. This is the exact same thing as uh, Japanification. And I think it will be the trend probably for the next five to 10 years. They will just keep diluting the currency. And, you know, people in the uh, TRI site lounge are uh, posting, you know, stagflation kind of pictures. You will see the raw asset prices rise. But in real dollar terms, nothing's happening. And it sucks. This is going to be a very, very tough economic pill to swallow. What I would suggest you do is just make damn sure you have your nut covered, got income needs covered, 
anything on top of that, go and invest because shit's rising in prices. And you see your Bitcoin. Problem here is don't chase, don't chase, don't chase. Trade your setups, buy Ws. There's lots of stuff in the market that's Wing out that looks really investable right now. Problem is, it's not something that's named the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and it's not something named Bitcoin right now. Um, so I hope that helps you see. This isn't going to be easy on our society. This is the newspaper number. This is reality, and it sucks. And if this is reality and price is here, and this is what we expect going forward, what the fuck is this thing going to do? My hunch is this is probably going to go up into the hundreds of thousands. It's going to be just absolute insanity. Or the whole damn thing collapses. But I think they've gotten away with the Fikazi. I don't think the system's going to collapse. But we'll see what happens. Like I said, they had to get beyond. Actually, it's really interesting. Uh, Powell even said himself. He told. He said it a couple times last year. He's just like, we just got to get through year end. We just got to get through year end. We just got to get through year end. <laughs> and I don't think anybody in the public picked up on that. If somebody was actually listening to him, he kept saying it over and over and over. And if somebody in the public had just said, well, what do you mean by that? Like, what, what what's actually going on? I bet you he would have been like, uh, uh, next question. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well. So, uh, I don't know whether you can understand that. Is it our job to really do anything about this? Can we do anything about this? Not really. This is the crazy for crazy world that we live in, but it's important to understand what reality, what your investments really are doing here. And then, of course, too, this is all a question of relatives right now. I'm not saying I'm bearish of Bitcoin. Bitcoin might just sit there and do nothing for the next year. That wouldn't surprise me. Um, what I am saying is I do like for the next 15 years, these things, these Dow Jones units, paper assets, growth assets over a Bitcoin. Remember that Mara story, right? Do you want, do you want 10x on your money, which is okay, or do you want 100x? It's up to you. All right, hopefully that helps. Okay, I said to a church to the stock price equities last 10 years. Okay, is this not considered part of greed? Well, the sad thing is, is no, we're not even close to greed. I haven't seen any greed kick in. What I've seen is assets that are trading dirt cheap the central bankers just went in and guaranteed the market and these assets got bid up following that event. That's all that I've seen. We have not seen any quote unquote greed in this market for this millennial generation, but you won't see that. Uh, that'll, that's going to take a good five, ten years before you even start seeing that. Yeah, you're too short term uh, time scaled here. All right, good job. Uh, nice. All right. Apologies to add to my question above, but this is something really important. <laughs> yeah, all of this is kind of important, eh? I'd like to understand. So even if we see such a big increase in equities since March 20, okay, most of tech, but others following suit later. I, I can show you lots of equities I've made a fortune on that aren't tech, so I don't know about that. Uh, the fact that hey, pff, hey, I'm fucking killing it in fluorite right now. <laughs> Yeah, we all want it, which is so funny because of my damn teeth. If anybody knows my story about me and my teeth, <laughs> so all the money I'm making in the fluoride mine's gonna go right back into the dentist. <laughs> now that's what you call trickle down economics. <laughs> all right, uh, the fact we're entering greed cycle indicates equity still have lot. Oh my, it's ridiculous how much room they have to go. But the problem here is, just because they have a long way to go. Don't chase, don't chase, don't chase. You know, I could show you a chart in 1987. Yeah, you know, I, a lot of people, and maybe a lot of you here, don't even remember what 87 was. 
A lot of people think about 1987 as a stock market crash, when in reality, the market didn't crash at all. Uh, 87, there it is there. All right, so I think we're sort of in this phase right now, right? And you see like big rallies and you're like, oh my God, have I missed the boat? But don't chase. I mean, look what's coming. Woohoo! Now, I don't think it's going to be this big because the baby boomers, they had like the wind at their back, the end of the Soviet Union, all that kind of stuff. So there was a number of reasons why equity did especially well here. I think this is very similar to sort of that post-Great uh, Depression cycle. But here's a good example. Like a lot of people look at 1987 and think of this as a stock market crash. When in reality, it wasn't all it was. I think I showed you this before, right? All it was was just a very natural 50% correction. Boink. And actually, if you go off of these lows, I think the intraday low uh, on that actually was a 50% uh, retrace. You know, I talked about it with you guys with Bitcoin about look left, right? Where does the market find support? And it's the same thing on Bitcoin. And remember, guys, that none of this shit's new. It's all the same stuff over and over and over and over and over. Um, so there's the Bitcoin chart. Can you see how, you know, probably if we do 50% levels off of this range, that's probably right in that traffic area there or maybe right in there. And you're just eyeballing it, you can see it. I don't know. Maybe I'm drunk. Am I drunk? I do know I gotta get going here, fucking Liam. Uh, yeah, okay, there we go. So you can see, look left, traffic area. My hunch is probably come down back down to this area, right? Which is uh, what's that? Twenty nine G's, right? And that's just natural. That's exactly as if uh, you know, nineteen eighty seven was just you know, it's a typical day in the market. So um, I don't know. Hope that helps. Uh, I can't even remember what the question was. Um, so don't chase, right? You know, uh, after the 87 crash, if you went and hunted your W's down in here, there were some great buys, you know, following that dumping. And of course, you guys know, you know, when Bitcoin crapped out there, they're just throwing everything away. So that's uh, kind of, you know, well, no, okay, no, I don't want to get into that. Let's uh, keep moving forward here, Brian. Liam's waiting. Okay. Uh, I hope that helps. Uh, okay, the fact that we're in the green side and you still have lots of, I mean, hey, but this is, you know, what you have to think about is decade, right? Think think like the next two decades, not not like next week. Uh, where does that put commodities like Bitcoin, gold, etc.? Considering they do not fare well in the greed cycle. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're old stories. I wouldn't be investing in, uh, in, um, um, physical assets right now i would be investing in paper assets and i think i told you i mean this is stupid what's happening on the site i uh started a registered account and i just threw some money in there and it was like 80 grand and i'm chicken shit by nature so i said okay fine i'll take 25 percent, put it in the market 20 grand and that 20 grand has turned into like 60 g's i mean is that normal that's not normal in fact, it was uh, 125. So now 80, it's, uh, uh, yeah, so it's like 65,000 now. It's ridiculous. So I, it feels to me like prices have gotten bid up. But uh, yeah, you're right. You know, Condiff cycles, same thing. Yep, uh, good point there. You want to put a link to uh, the Condiff uh, cycles? And I always mispronounce his name, but yep, same sort of thing. Um, but, uh, and I've sort of said this before, right? I'm not in vet, like a country like Canada, a country like Canada is a short. This place is a sell. Every, you look out the window here. If I was a Mr. Trillionaire market uh, player, I would look at Canada and I would say short that fucking thing into the ground. Their politicians are fucking pie in the sky uh, little self-appointed despots. They the balance sheet of this country. This country is bankrupt. They invested. They literally mortgaged their future on this thing called the tar sands, investing in a technology that's 20th century that's basically going to be obsolete. 
The political partner now to the south is environmentally friendly and has Greta whispering in his ear 24 7. I mean, this country's a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, by the way, Canada's uh, currency is considered a commodity currency in the world's eyes. Uh, it makes no sense to me, I'll tell you. And usually when things don't make sense, after a while they will make sense. And <laughs> people wake up and go, oh, that $4 million house in Burnaby's only bid 500000 now? Hmm, what a surprise. And the funny thing is, you know, 500,000 Canadian dollars for a half decent suburban home. That's that's probably realistic. But uh, could we see Canadian equity prices uh, for houses here fall by 70, 80% here? Well, you guys see 70, 80% corrections in the corn all the time, so I don't see any reason why not. And what's really scary about a country like Canada, Australia, um, Russia definitely uh saudi arabia to a certain degree south africa when the americans decide to you know the bankers when they decide to pull in the reins it's all these outside non-american interests they're the ones that get sacrificed um and that's what i mean basically paul volcker's war on inflation he basically just gave the the rest of the world the finger said fuck you i don't care about you and the rest of the world went fucking tits up so I don't know, you know buyer beware <laughs> so yeah no i don't want to invest in physical assets right now i sure do like the crypto gross story don't get me wrong i mean uh, i love that library credits i love decentraland that mara mana or mara mana mana I love uh, Seward's LTO. I love uh, IBM's Internet of Things and the Stellar Lumens. I love those kind of stories. Those are fucking awesome. Uh, and I love investing in crypto-related companies that can leverage crypto to drive earnings. Oh, my sexy sex. That's that Mara conversation. You can 10x your commodity, eh, but I'll take 100x in the equity. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay uh keep moving forward regarding quiz question how much value does the stock market usually lose in a recession usually about 50 percent haircut so just uh answer answer was 50 percent. hey look at that <laughs> can you elaborate on the answer why is it 50 percent? doing some research i found it was typically 25 to 35 percent yeah i mean you just go back and look at the past four or five recessions you'll see it's pretty obvious uh, but what's most important is you actually have to look at a recession. Don't just pick every uh, market correction. Actually just go and, you know, and you can find these resources on the net. It's not too difficult. Uh, but 50% is usually the hallmark. I think just in March alone, that was like, a, I don't know, 35, 38% or something like that. I mean, if that was the correction and it's done and we look back and you say, Brian, it wasn't 50%. Fuck you. I want my money back. Well, you know, um, the point here is you should look for that 50% correction in equity prices. Unfortunately, I don't even know whether we're done with this. We might still have another 50% haircut here. We are now into the recession. So that's a good thing. Now, the good part about this is the banksters, they're driving the bus. They've got all of the equity on their books now. And uh, I don't think they have any interest whatsoever in losing their money. So they're not going to let this market break. They'll be more than happy to do more quantitative easing, that kind of stuff. And they're not going to let the market break. If you look in real value terms, your asset values go down. But in headline dollar terms, hey, hey it's still a bull market. And that sucks because they shouldn't do that. They did do that, so now we have to adjust all of our charts to try and see the real picture. It's brutal. They're not making our lives any easier, that's for sure. Uh, can you elaborate on the exit? So 50 per, uh, 50 percent is usually a pretty good number. You know, like if you look at, uh, I think even the Canadian stock market, it just got its ass kicked there. Uh, what was this? 
sell that high. Whoops. Uh, that high was uh, 27, and they took it all the way down to 17. Yeah, not quite a 50%. 50% would have been, what, 13 and a half? So, you know, I, I suppose somebody could go, well, Brian, you said this had to be 50%, which is, where is that? That's right there. But we stopped here. I want my money back. Yeah. I, I, as I said, I, I don't even know if we're done here. You might find that, hey, here, <laughs> there's your 50%, right? Uh, and we, you know, this is Da Vinci Nightmare kind of chart, right? Where we come back and have to test against these lows, but we make new highs, blah, 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 blah. But this is basically what you should have been looking for. Now, if you look over uh, overseas, like in London, um, I'm actually be curious. You, okay, fun. I don't even know what it would be called. I suppose there's the, the FTSE. So that topped out at uh, 7,900 and we bottomed at 4,800. Not quite. Half of 7,900 would have been just under 4,000, right? Eh? Uh, you know, here's the 2008 financial crisis, 67, and there's 34. So that's basically 50%. 2,000 top, there is uh, 7, 33. So you can see those are both 50% corrections. So are we done here? I mean, this market still looks like it's smiling at me, eh? So yeah, we just put in this W here, but wouldn't that be funny if this rallied up and then came down and then did your 50% from top to bottom? I don't know. I mean, just on, on balance, the 50% uh, equity correction is a good rule of thumb. And then, of course, you know, that's WD GAN. So if you really want to study more of that stuff, uh, you know, get into the level two program where we uh, we really get into uh, Mr. GAN. <clears throat> okay, uh, can you elaborate on fear and greed assets? Well, I think I did quite a bit on that today. So I can fully understand the concept. A simple list of fear assets and greed assets will suffice. Well, fear assets, commodities. Greed assets, paper assets. Well, that was nice and easy. Based on the money flow lecture, where are we now in the cycle from 2017 and how did COVID impact the charts markets? Okay, so I've talked lots about that today. Go back and uh, re-watch uh, today's video. I've, I went over that a few times. Rotational markets. How do we see or predict the rotation from one sector to another in the markets? How does this play out in the cryptocurrency space? Thanks. Um, I like to use what's called uh, sector rotation analysis. Um, put out by a good gentleman by the name of uh, uh, Sam Stovall. I actually think it was his dad. Uh, but uh, the Stovall family, they've done the sector rotation uh, modeling for I don't know, probably 30 or 40 years. Uh, so you can look into that. Uh, it is a concept that we teach in our level three program, probably a little advanced for you just getting going here with your education. So uh, get the process down licked, get the journaling, the logging, the uh, plan, Get the risk management, identify what type of player you are, get the financial planning down, allocate certain amount of capital to different asset classes, um, get the 100 paper trades going, uh, learn about uh, what a half decent setup looks like in the second half of this level one program. Again, get those 100 paper trades going. Um, Get to the point where you take personal ownership of setups like the El Tanganator or the bot setup, you know, so you can really identify what kind of trader you are, what really appeals to you. Uh, and my hunch is by that time, you will be at the point where you're ready to start learning about things like sector rotation analysis. Like I said, probably, you know, it's, uh, it's about two thirds of the way through our level three program that we get into that. Very advanced stuff, um, and um, 
you know, if anything, it's good that uh, we do like uh, seasonality trading and sector rotation modeling. First two weeks, you've probably heard me make reference to that on the site. You probably don't even really want to get into that kind of stuff until you've been around the site for a good, you know, six, eight, 12 months kind of idea. And you really kind of know what this trader life is all about. Uh, they always said, in fact, I even uh, posted in the class today, they always say, uh, you never really know a job, and if you want to be a trader, well, that's a job, it's a profession. You never really know a job until you've actually done it for one full year. And I hate to say it, I think that's actually perfectly valid for all of our crypto uh, people. Uh, and anybody really who comes to the Level 1 program. By the time you get through that full year, usually you're through Level 2, Level 3. And I notice, you know, about a year, year and a half in, I can really start to see each of the students start to blossom in their own way. And, you know, some students, they really love sector rotation analysis. Um, others, nah, it's not me. So, ironically enough, half of what I do is uh, just simply um, setting the table just show you this stuff and you ultimately at the end of this decide you know what that really appeals to me I like that and off you go in that direction uh, oh boy what's Shane saying here Fabian Fabian all right uh, what should our trading duration be day trading what should the time frame for our trading be um, actually, I asked, I remember somebody asked this in the uh, lounge through class. I thought actually you were going to put that in the Q&A document for Grim. <laughs> um, I mean, you can ask me here. I would, I would actually prefer that you go the route that Grim would like you to go. I think he is an excellent person for you level oneers. Ironically enough, actually, I think he's a far better instructor than I would be. Uh, somebody was in the class going today, you know, why are so many off-topic questions? And I was like, well, who cares? Grim loves it, man. He's just taking it in stride. And he's just such a boss. He uh, handles everybody with kid gloves. <laughs> I'd be like, shut up! <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, whatever path Grim lays out for you, I think you just do perfectly fine following his path. Uh, I mean, at this point with the level one, you probably don't even know what you want to do. You probably want, probably, you know, what's in your best interest is your journaling. What did I see today? What did I learn? How do I feel? Uh, you're probably seeing different participants on the site doing different things. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe it's cryptocurrencies, maybe it's uh, stock options, maybe it's futures contracts, maybe it's uh, uh, warrants. I mean, you never know in this crazy game. There's so many different ways to skin the cat. Um, interestingly enough, by you asking this question, you've actually already answered the question. Right now, you have to sit and you just have to sit and watch and ultimately you have to decide what appeals most to you there is no right or wrong way to do this the rightest and the or the wrong well the rightest way to do this is what actually keeps you interested keeps you engaged um some people come to me and they're like well brian i already got full-time career last thing in the world i want to do is be a fucking pit trader trading crude oil <laughs> Okay, you know, well, obviously day trader setups, not for you. <laughs> um, it's good that you're asking this question. And if anything, what I'd like you to do is write this question in your journal and you answer this now. And what's so cool is by the time you get to the end of this 12-week program, when you go back and you read these questions, you'll be like, oh, I remember in week five, I came to this great conclusion that I love uh, swing trading, right? trading off a four hour time frame. I think uh, Grim, he likes to swing trade. I think that's his preferred uh, time frame. You get in a level two program, you work with Kiran for a while and he's, he's just day trading the futures contracts, just having a great old time. 
And you're like, well, you know what? Maybe I think I want to head off and be a futures trader on top step. Okay. It's up to you. Um, then you get to the uh, level three and you work with Brian and he shows you these crazy derivative products. And you're like, fuck it, man. I'm just doing T-R-I-S-O-Fs. And that's it. <laughs> okay. So I think to begin with, your job is just to have an open mind. And the good part about sites like TradingView is they do have this thing uh, called the replay function where you can practice. Uh, you know, like, um, oh, where's that dummy chart I was using? Yeah, right here. So, like, this is a weekly price chart. Uh, maybe I'm a position trader, so I'm going to practice taking positions off of the weekly price charts because I like to be really slow. And I said, well, and I kind of think there's an M working, so I'm going to place a um, sell on stop order just below that low. And I'm going to risk against this double top, right, the M top. And that Beamish guy goes, says, well, if I'm going to do this trade, I really should try and eh, do like a two to one risk reward. And you can just see what happens. Well, would have been filled. The position's just working, working. Oh, look at, oh, nice. Still working, still working. Oh, look at that. I just got filled. Yay. So I could change this to like a five minute chart. Just do exactly the same thing that I just showed you. So you can practice to your heart's content. But for me to actually tell you, you should be doing only swing trades. You should be doing only day trades. Well, that's actually not doing you any favors. Really, what I would prefer is you just keep an open mind. And really, ironically enough, the person who actually answers this question is you. What do you like? What do you want to do? Uh, crazy Stewart's trading off his one-minute charts. <laughs> I think he learned a very valuable lesson. Uh, don't keep open positions on one-minute charts. You're going to get your ass kicked. <laughs> so, you know, I, you know, that's half the problem I have with this site is I can sit here and I can bark to my fucking heart's content about something, but half the time you guys don't even listen to me. Uh, it drives me nuts. But oh well. I remember the old pit guys at Top Step said, Brian, you're wasting your time. Oh uh, well. Okay, uh, keep moving forward. Two more questions and then we're done. Oh, a level two question. Oh, you bastards. Okay, can you please clarify what does analyst overconfidence mean? I found that statement in creating the strategies. Yeah. Um, I think in the module I told you the story about uh, Louis Rukeyser and the elves. Uh, Louis Rukeyser used to have a panelist of Wall, a panel of Wall Street analysts all on his uh, show, and you can Google Louis Rukeyser Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser and see the panel and all the old shows and stuff. I think we even have the uh, the 1987 crash broadcast in our library. And interestingly enough, they usually just sort of, you know, some are bullish, some are bearish. But in the uh, in the fall of 1999 and the winter of 2000, every single one of them turned bullish except for one chick. And she was famous for not giving in. But in essence, all of these Wall Street analysts, all, every single one of them, except for Gail, <laughs> went bullish. Well, that's got to be a warning sign. And it was. So, you know, if I hear 20 talking heads all bearish of the U.S. dollar on social media, what do you think generally I'm going to be thinking as a contrarian investor? How about when Tone Vase and everybody were insanely bearish on crypto? How did that go? I had like $3,000. So that's what I mean. You know, you could even use uh, tone vase as analyst overconfidence 
um, in the crypto space. <laughs> so you can plug in Wall Street analyst or you can take this out and say cryptocurrency analyst. Same thing. All right, so I hope that helps. And last question, for a tricking out horizontal support and resistance, can I take fractals as pivot points on each time frame? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, I like that thinking. Um, the only difference I would say is, of course, you want to color code or maybe, uh, yeah, probably color code the horizontal support and resistance line based on the time frame that you're drawing your fractal off of. But you want to do them off of fractal pivots? Perfect, awesome, awesome, awesome. That's actually really good thinking. In fact, uh, whoever asked this question, uh, show me. Show, I want to see your chart. Do it up this, go off of the fractals. I'd say do like uh, weekly, daily, and four hour. And uh, show me your chart. Let's say going back to um, probably the base um at 150 dollars um on that my current rage quit actually that reminds me you know this trading view somebody posted a uh a link from trading view saying they had the history of bitcoin annotated on the chart and they got a whole bunch of the fucking references wrong i was like who the hell and what's worse is i was on trading view when all this shit happened who the hell writes this crap for trading view trading view was obviously there couldn't believe that. I mean, that was just a waste. I mean, total fluff garbage. Oh, well. <laughs> okay. All right. It is now 1.30. I've talked for forever. Hope you guys all enjoyed that. You know, I'm sorry for the, uh, the YouTube audience. Probably not a heck of a lot that you guys got out of that. But, you know, we had a huge week here uh, with this uh, particular module. So there was a lot of stuff that I really wanted to talk about uh, with the uh, students here today. So thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, is that Andre or Andrea? <laughs> oh, God, you damn Andres. I got like 20 different Andres running around the site. They're all spelled exactly the same way. Some of them are girls. Some of them are boys. I have no idea. I don't know what the hell happened. In Are, are you all from Italy? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's funny anyway have yourselves a great day wish me luck with liam all the best and bye for now